Morn by Alfred Drury, given to the city square Leeds, along with a lot of other nymphs, by Alderman Harding in 1903. Of course, it represents the triumph of that new and hygienic invention, the electric light. And when you come to a city, you generally see the city square. Here we are in the city square at Leeds, and there's such a lot to see in Leeds, and it's so full of individuality, I don't know where to start, except that skyline is very important. And you can see there the Black Prince, who symbolizes the cloth trade which brought prosperity to Leeds. You can see him outlined against the sky, designed by Brock. And skyline seems always to have mattered until just lately in Leeds. Look at the Queen's Hotel, rebuilt, I think, in the 30s. Even there, they bothered to put little pavilions on the top of the building. Not so next door, where I think British Railways has put up that extraordinary thing which blots out all sky and has no thought for the skyline at all. But see the Midland Bank next door, 1890s, a classical, lovely curve of the corner. And then see, soaring up, out of scale with everything round it. What a relief it is to come down to the Unitarian Church, 1847. Non-conformist leads, sturdy and prickly against the sky. And even the post office of the 1880s, you see, has got a bit of consideration for the skyline, though it's not exactly an inspired building. But when we look at Leeds, I think you'll find that it's very human and individualistic, and it'll continue to be so, provided it isn't spoiled by the now old-fashioned idea of building huge slabs so as to get as much money out of the ground as possible, like that brute of a thing there, which only says cash and doesn't say anything else. Town Hall. That's the place for civic pride. It symbolized all the wealth and industry of the north of England, and probably one of the best Victorian town halls anywhere is this one, Leeds Town Hall. It was opened in 1853, and the architect was Cuthbert Broderick, a Hull man, and he was only 29 years old when he designed it and he used local stone and a splendid sense of scale he had. These columns here, they come from Darley Dale in Derbyshire. This is York stone at my feet. And those white lions, they come from the south of England. They were done by a sculptor called Noble who went to the London Zoo and carved them out of Portland stone. But the grandest exterior feature of this town hall is the tower, Broderick's Tower, with its sense of outline, when you see it above the old houses of Leeds. Of course, there was an awful row on the town council about that tower. A lot of people said it was spending too much money on ornament. But you know, the spirit behind building this grand town hall was something more than just showing you were rich. It was to show that in the middle of all the noise of industry and the nuts and bolts and the steam and smoke, there was a love of the arts. And Leeds had always been a musical place back in the 18th century. And here in the town hall, they had musical festivals. And the idea was that the town hall should draw people from all over the world. And when it was built, here's a quotation from Asa Briggs's essay on the opening of the town hall. 
They hoped that Leeds Town Hall would attract to our town the visits of strangers, dilettante tourists, that's you and me, and the lovers of art from distant places. And that tradition of loving music has gone on in Leeds to the present day. strange scene is this, here in the meadows of the river Air. Modern architecture? No. These sort of pyramid things are skylights which light what used to be a flax spinning mill, Marshall's Mill, and it now lights very effectively what is a mail order service. And it was built by John Marshall in 1840 and he chose the Egyptian style I think because he wanted to have a sort of temple of industry in the meadows of the air an Egyptian temple and also because Leeds owed a lot of its prosperity to the Napoleonic Wars and there was the campaign in Egypt well that style was only one of the many curious styles that Leeds industrialists favoured in the last century. Look over there. Isn't that Giotto's Campanile from Florence? And you know, every sort of style was used in Leeds in the last century. John Barron, the clothier, must have been inspired by the Arabian Nights when in 1879 he got Thomas Ambler to design St. Paul's house there in Park Square. And come on onto this roof again of Marshall's Mill. Look at the Egyptian detail round the corner here. Nothing skimped. Look at those urns carved above the pigeon droppings. And behind the mill of Marshall's, you can see the earlier sort of local brick Yorkshire mill that goes with children working in factories in the days before the Factory Acts, and then back to this amazing Leeds 19th century skyline. And far in the distance, 20th century, the University Tower, then some more chimneys, and one with an outline which looks to me Italianate or Romanesque, and beyond that, the dear old town hall, and to the right of that, Vincent Harris's civic building and that is the end of the old Leeds skyline because to the right of it you see the battle of the cubes just money getting slabs built since the war with the lift machinery like parcels left on the top and that noise you sometimes hear pickaxes and falling walls is old Leeds being destroyed around us. Benjamin Gott, the enlightened mill owner, 
died in 1839, and his tomb was moved into this great church of St. Bartholomew Armley, which was built in 1872. And it was to be a sort of Kirkstall Abbey translated onto the hill. But Benjamin Gott did not build these brick houses, these leads back to backs, on the steps of one of which I'm sitting. They have their advantages and they have their disadvantages. One of the disadvantages is communal sanitation, no back garden, the only front garden, the street. But you could, if you lived in a house like this, see your children and what was happening to them, and you could see your neighbors, and you were part of a kind of village life of the street. And now they're being destroyed in Leeds very fast. Towns and cities aren't just places for grand civic display, they're also places to get out of the wind and the weather in. And Leeds is full of alleys. And down one of these alleys, you'll find white locks. Look at the riot of color. Look at those tiles. And then, what a rest and what a welcome this place is on a windy day when you come in from the streets. White locks, I suppose, in origin, maybe 18th century or earlier, but mostly what one sees here is Victorian and a little bit later. I think wherever you look, you th see things have been cared for and polished, and you're obviously in the north of England. It's a city dining rooms with a bar mixed. I mean, look at that. Uh, brass work, like you get on a roundabout. Box pews. And let's treat the place like a church. I mean, there, the stained glass and the harvest festival display above it. And more than that, the lettering on mirrors and the names of firms that have long since been amalgamated with other firms. And then the stained glass in the windows too. Spenfield Wheatwood, which is the kind of Wimbledon on the north side of Leeds, and it was built in 1877. And inside here, you'd think you're in a church, wouldn't you? This is the staircase hall. Above me are man's pursuits in the open air. And to right and left of me, there are women's work shown in the home. A woman's place was in the home. Every detail is expensive. It was built for the Oxley family. They were bankers. And really, it's worth looking at the detail. Even here in the staircase hall, no expense spared. Look at the browns and yellows of this inlaid wood. Leeds brass for this splendid lamp standard. Gas originally there. And from the woods round Leeds, hand-carved plants. But that's only one little bit of this amazing collection of expensive detail. It's very nice to see money spent and enjoyed in this way. And the architect was Corson, who did the Grand Theatre Leeds. Come downstairs and see some more. The last of the Oxleys left this house in 1948. And until then, gas lights and everything, it was a private house full of furniture, trophies of the chase and a few books and 
detail everywhere, which has been carefully preserved. I mean, look at it there, Aberdeen granite here, local stone here for these leaves. And then, by a great bit of luck, and foresight too, the Leeds Corporation gave this house over to the waterworks department. And the waterworks people, being engineers, appreciated what was well made, and they've kept it all. So you'll see some of their things about in it, but you'll, if you come over to here, the other side of the hall, you'll go to the ladies' part, which is the withdrawing room, which is really unbelievable. And thank goodness it's still as it was. Come and look. There you are. This was redesigned for the ladies as a drawing room in 1888 by George Faulkner Armitage. And I think the influence on him must have been the famous Peacock Room by Whistler, uh, which was down in Chelsea. And he brought it, a, a version of it here to Leeds. Oriental China, it was a great time for collecting that. And these brackets all along the top here were for the display of Oriental China. And the grandest China of all was to be in this cabinet, which is part of the design. And you'll notice that the leading here in the glass suggests peacock feathers and is very elaborate. And you'll see, again, peacock colouring in these panels, gold, green, and blue. And a lot of care over detail to how to keep dust off the books. Look, a hinged flap. But the piece de resistance of the room was the fireplace. Peacock feathers above it, inlaid wood, satin wood, walnut, rosewood. And then look at that for an Art Nouveau gas fire or pre-Art Nouveau. And look at the hearth that goes with it in colored marble. In this amazing room, I think the only survival of Corson's more robust design is uh, the ceiling and that wonderful gas bracket there made of a peak of, um, looks like thistles in copper. But you get back to the peacock room again with the stained glass along the tops of the windows. Oh, how fashionable and marvelous it must have seemed in 1890 to the ladies of Leeds when they came here and felt themselves in touch, however gray and dark it was outside, felt themselves in touch with Paris, the world of art in Bond Street and Chelsea. And if you want to see really elaborate work of the same date by Armitage, look at that door plate as I go out. Welcome the coming. Speed the parting guest. Bean, Carline, Kell, Musgrave, Stamp, Mabane. This is Woodhouse Cemetery, where many of the richer families of Leeds were buried. And in front of each of these stones, at one time and another, the family assembled, while the house far off in Headingley, or maybe Chapel Allerton, waited empty, and the light streamed through the stained glass of the front door onto the tiles of the entrance hall, and then the family returned, and the lawyer read the will, and look at that stone. To the memory of a fisherman, 
who came from the North Riding and probably was born, yes, in the 18th century, lived till, a, till the age of 80 in Leeds, always longing for the country and getting his consolation in fishing, remembering his village and the spire of the church and the birds and the fishes and there at the bottom is his fishing basket. Woodhouse Cemetery is in the middle of Leeds University and the university with a good deal of imagination has saved bits of the cemetery and kept groups of tombs together so that you can always remember it was a cemetery and the rest they are turning into a landscaped park. Thus, the old Victorian Leeds gives way to the new generation. That's the old Leeds, and so is this, Thornton's Arcade. Sometimes it rains in Leeds. Sometimes you don't want to walk in a road in a smell of diesel. Sometimes you want the fun of the fair. And here you've got it in the county arcades, designed by Frank Matcham, a showman architect. He built London's Coliseum. But in Leeds, he rarely let himself go. Public clocks are a great feature of Leeds in the old city. But here at Seacroft, it looks to me as though time is rather more computerized. And the people who use this shopping center of Seacroft, which is a new town Leeds Corporation has built outside the city on a hill, the people who use this center, instead of using the crowded markets, they live, a lot of them, in tall blocks like that. It's all done with the best intentions. But if you lived in one of those flats, I wonder if you wouldn't rather look back with regret at the old days when you had a back-to-back -back house and there was the communal life and the corner shops and the cobbled streets. I wonder if you wouldn't feel a bit lonely. It's all done with the best intentions, yes. But speaking personally, I feel it's rather like compulsory shopping, compulsory pleasure, compulsory leisure, compulsory art.